Welcome back, everybody, to another episode of Lockdown 23 and 1. Today, ladies and gentlemen, we're traveling to Canada. And this story has many twists and turns and shows a dirty side of prison. You know, a lot of people think them Canadian prisons are all right. They're smooth sailing, man. It ain't nothing like the U.S. Well, this story might make you think twice. So let's get right into it. If you enjoy this type of content, all things lock up and crime related, then this is where you want to be. Hit that like, subscribe, notification bell before you leave. And check out my playlist with many more videos for you to start watching today. But it all begins with the killing of Mr. Stephen Miller, a New Brunswick man. And New Brunswick happens to be one of the 13 provinces of Canada. But as the sun rose over the quaint suburbia of a New Brunswick town, the quiet lives of regular people were disrupted by the body dumped in their driveway. Stephen Miller lay on the pavement, blood surrounding his body from knife wounds and blunt force trauma. He was left there to die in public, laid out for the residents of Bayview Heights and Conception Bay South to see when they woke up in the morning. But for more than two years, the details of the killing were kept private, covered by a publication ban, until all four men charged with playing a part in his death made their way through the court system. Now, these guys have already went through the court process, been sentenced, not to mention some crazy turn of events that happened to them in prison. But first, let's rewind it all the way to what happened to Mr. Stephen Miller. Get the fuck up, we're taking you to a hospital, man. You got stabbed in your heart. Those are the words heard during a 911 call that Mr. Connolly, 36, made. Miller sat in a chair bleeding out. The 25-year-old would soon be dead, while Connolly and three other men would be charged with first-degree murder. Chelsea Lucas, 24, Calvin Kenny, 26, and Kyle Morgan, 20. Connolly told dispatch exactly where they were, 1625 Conception Bay Highway, at about 4.13 a.m. Officer William Kennedy overheard units being dispatched to the address. He was only a minute away and headed to the home. Now look, one of the major things I got so far from this story is one of the guys that was a part of the grand scheme to get Mr. Stephen Miller was on the phone with dispatch trying to save his life. So obviously something took place and it escalated to the point where they killed the man. If they meant to kill him, then they wouldn't be calling 911. They'll be hiding the body and trying to make sure no one knows nothing. Something went wrong in whatever they were doing. Now, as the officer neared the address, he saw a woman who was extremely shaken and distraught with blood on her hands and t-shirt. DNA testing would show that the blood belonged to both Miller and Kenny. She told the officer that three men with guns and knives had come into the home and abducted Miller, her boyfriend's brother. She also told him that the house was on fire. Imagine being home, though, and three people kick in the door at 4 a.m., you know, but they come in with masks, blacked out, with guns and knives. And she said it was her boyfriend's brother, but I don't think her boyfriend was home. It was just her, and he was probably sleeping in a different room. But if you ain't got no gun, and even if you do, you'd probably be passed out, wouldn't be able to grab it in time. It would be a terrifying situation, man. And if you got kids seeing all these guys run into your house, I mean, you're completely at their will. You can fight them off as much as you want, but chances are you might lose your life like Mr. Miller did. But the woman said that she heard loud banging on the doors and three men forced their way into the house using the front and rear doors. She said the men were dressed in black and they were wearing masks. We know who you are, she heard Miller say. What do you want? The witness then heard a struggle and saw the men drag Miller from his bedroom. She watched as the two men held Miller down while the other man assaulted him. She said she heard one of the men say shoot him. The man who had been assaulting Miller came into her bedroom and pointed a gun at her, demanding to know if she called police. Maybe they didn't know that she was in the house at the time, but it doesn't take long to call 911. So these guys are probably running everything through their mind, you know, trying to check all their ends and immediately snaps into action. Go get the girl and see if she called the cops. We were wrangling this dude up for far too long. She had to have. When she came out the bedroom, she saw Miller covered in blood sitting in a chair with a stab wound to his upper right chest. She said the men told Miller he was coming with them and they were going to save his life. But there again, you can tell that this was not a part of the plan. She saw two men take Miller outside while the third man poured gasoline from a yellow can around the living room. He asked her for a match, then he lit the house on fire and left, she said. 
And for everybody wondering why the hell they showed up to Stephen Miller's house to begin with, this is why. When the police searched the house after the attack, they found pills, white powder that looked like cocaine, and a substantial quantity of marijuana and a large sum of cash. This right here was a robbery gone wrong. Forensic work identified Calvin Kinney's blood in 12 different places in or around the house, including on the handle of a buck knife and a crawl space, which had Miller's blood on the blade. So Calvin Kinney, he's the superstar here. And like I said, this story has a crazy turn of events that takes place in prison. And it's all going to revolve around Mr. Calvin Kinney himself. At 4.19 a.m., there's another call to 911. The dispatcher heard a man say, I'm going to save this guy's life. Where's the nearest hospital? I got him in my arms right now. I'm trying to save his life here. It was Calvin Kinney on the phone. Kinney continued. He was on the side of the road. I drove by and picked him up. I don't know where we are, Kinney said on the call. In the background, Miller was heard moaning in pain, saying, let me get out. Kinney replied, go on, get out. I am, said Miller. Kinney then told dispatch he tried to attack him while he was helping him. So he left him on the side of the road. The call was being made on Miller's cell phone. It would turn out that Miller, still alive, was actually dumped in a driveway at 46 Bayview Heights in Conception Bay South. That's where he would die from his stab wounds. Miller had wounds to his back, face, left armpit, as well as other areas. The most significant wound was the upper right side of his heart. Now one more thing before we jump into the prison side of things. This was the plan. Earlier that evening, Morgan, Lucas, and Kenny picked up Connolly in St. John's. Morgan was driving his red Honda Civic after picking up Connolly. They talked about doing a drug rip, a slang term for robbery. They drove to Morgan's house in Paradise first. Lucas, Kennedy, and Connolly had gotten a gray van and drove to Miller's place to commit the robbery. Morgan stayed behind, but he was still convicted as well. Fast forward through the court process and the confessions and all that good stuff. Mr. Lucas and Kenny were sentenced to 12 and a half years. Paul Connolly gets 10 and a half years. And Kyle Morgan, even though he was a part of the plan but decided to stay home, was sentenced to one year as well. They got smoked, man. And what I've realized, like in Canada and Europe, man, they don't give as much time for murders as other places. But like I said, let's get to the crazier turn of events of what happens to Mr. Kenny in prison. This is a surveillance video though, Paul Connolly and Calvin Kinney attacking another inmate by the name of Kenny Green. Paul Connolly, 25, seen in the white t-shirt, struck Green with a piece of church pew. It says both Kenny and Connolly are associated with a self-branded gang formed in the HMP called St. John's Mob. St. John's Mob, baby. So these guys are in the mix completely, right? This is the turn of events. Turns out Mr. Kenny is sick and tired of the living conditions inside the penitentiary. Here's a video of him speaking about it. No visits, no calls. You know, you're in lockdown 24 seven and there's nothing you can do to, to elevate, alleviate the feeling of hopelessness. Our wrongs don't justify their wrongs, just as their wrongs don't justify ours, you know? But there's gotta be another approach to solve these issues. I'm living with these people in the show and they don't understand how to clean yourself. You know, they don't understand how to ask for help and they don't understand if what's being done to them is right or wrong. They don't understand how to contest it or question it, you know? While I was housed in segregation in other prisons, this is what I know better now, they give you a reason why you're there. You're there for X reason. This is what you gotta do to get out. This is what you gotta work towards. Now I was in that show, I got about 11 to 12 months done in that show. While there, I have never ever been given one reason why I was there. You're someone who's in here because someone died. Yeah. Uh, you have a violent history. What do you say to people who are going to say, I have, no, I have no sympathy for you? Well, of course you don't. But you got to realize that 90 plus percent of the inmates in Canada's prisons are going to be released back into the public. So do they think that severe punishment in prison is going to help their behavior when they get out? You know what I mean? It's not. Now, Mr. Kinney was actually put back into general population, and the unit that he goes into has another inmate in there by the name of Brandon Blake Colfer, 27. He happens to be in there for murder as well. Turns out a little situation happens inside the cell between these two killers, and it ended with Mr. Kinney getting stabbed over 50 times and dying in his prison cell. Almost the exact same way that he left Mr. Miller to die on the concrete in someone's driveway. Mr. Colfer admitted to using a 20 centimeter shank 
Colford was sentenced to an extra 22 years in prison. But Mr. Colford said, I had to do what I had to do for my own safety. According to statements, Colford and Kenny were in the same unit at the prison with other inmates from Newfoundland who considered Kenny their leader. The statement says that Colford claimed Kenny and his gang threatened to harm him because they alleged he had snitched. But keep in mind, this ain't nothing new for Mr. Kenny. They were on video attacking a snitch in the prison chapel and his goons were following behind him so yeah Colford might have been really scared and decided to take his life before they took his but yeah this was just a crazy story to me i had to bring it to y'all's attention let me know what y'all think in the comment section below it's crazy to see someone doing an interview with the news crew so full of life and determined to get some change done get mutilated in the cell shortly after and he ain't never gonna have to worry about no kind of mistreatment and lock up ever again crazy but as always, ladies and gentlemen, stay tuned. I got plenty more content coming your way. Got a lot of interviews to do over the weekend that kind of got ruined this past weekend because I, I had a lot lined up. As a matter of fact, the repairman's upstairs right now because my fridge died on me a day and a half ago in the middle of the night. And it was on a Sunday. I don't know if you can hear that hissing sound. He's doing something up there, but it was on a Sunday so no one could come out. They're finally out here, man. I can't wait to get... It was the uh, uh, compressor, which is the most expensive part, but LG's covering it. Shout out to LG with the warranty. But these kids, they've been driving me crazy. Snack this, snack that. Without a fridge, you ain't got no snacks. All I got in there is some moon pies. Let them nibble on those for a few hours. Nah, I'm just playing. We did a lot of takeout for that day and a half, but we need that fridge back and running. Not to mention, I just got groceries, so I went... Uh, and lost like $380 worth of food overnight. So I have to restock that. And this is my second time actually doing this video. The first time I recorded it all the way through. And it turns out my voice sounded like damn Satan himself. It was spooky, man. So, you know, it was just a rough morning, rough day and a half. Either way, that content train will always keep on chugging. Until the next time, y'all be easy, be safe, and stay free.